Hi, and welcome back to another episode of the History of Fan Anime. I am your host, William Chow, and today I'm going to get a, do another uh, uh, sort of an informational and an awfully high tech kind of episode because, again, uh, I want to get to uh, lay a good background before we begin our episode of uh, how we formed Arctic Animation. So that's going to come up in another uh, episode really soon. So you want to hit subscribe below and catch that one because that's a you know a pretty important episode there. But uh, in today's episode, I'm going to go over some of the tech that was uh, part of our era uh, in the late '80s and the '90s um, because that's very important uh, of why uh, it was such a hard problem getting things started uh, with subtitling and and uh, you know with all the um, uh, you know technical problems that we had because technology was still really, really raw at this time and uh, you know the capability of the computers were really, really, uh, really light at this time so that's why um, we couldn't do a lot of things uh, that you could nowadays um, with the more modern uh, computers. So uh, we'll begin with that. So what kind of uh, tech are we talking about? Well, okay, um, when you look to talk about like TVs, you know, we didn't have uh, you know, the era of PVRs, uh, there's no high def TVs, there's no uh, flat screen, whether or not uh, it's plasma or uh, LED, none of that. We're talking about standard tube type TV, tube type color TVs, okay? Uh, there's no HDMI inputs and no, uh, you know, uh, DVI inputs, it's just standard cable and audio and video in, okay? So we're not talking higher resolution. We're talking, uh, you know, normal res normal TV resolution. So we're not talking about, uh, you know, uh, 1080p or 1080i, any of that kind of stuff. We're just talking standard TV screen resolution, which is down at 320, okay? Uh, the medium of, uh, of uh, you know, recording and, uh, and uh, storage is still the VHS tape. Uh, some people still had beta tapes at this time, but again, this was a medium that was very easy to record. Unfortunately, uh, you know, there was a lot of quality issues because again, the more times you copy over a VHS tape, uh, you know, the, 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 the poorer the quality is. You also get lots of video loss between copies. So, you know, if you're going from one video cassette to another video cassette, you again, you're losing picture color. The, the images are shifting, the sync levels are all, they're all uh, getting out of sync, so again, the picture becomes less stable. You know, a lot of issues with multiple uh, generational copies, which isn't available, uh, which, which doesn't happen on things like DVDs and, and also all, all our digital streams and that kind of stuff that we have now. Okay, so that's one of the things that we had, we had to fight with. Another major problem is the computers were really, really slow, okay? Now, the computer, the, you know, uh, at this time, you know, the, the most popular video game systems were all 8-bit computer, uh, computer consoles. So we're talking like Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo. Sure, there are newer stuff starting to come out, but they're, you know, they're, not, out, they're, they're not out at this present moment. Same thing with computers. Right now, the uh, home market was basically the Apple II series of computers and the Commodore 64 uh, types of computers. Just on the horizon is the Macintosh, the Amiga and uh, Atari even has their their 520 STs, all sort of on rise and getting ready to come out. Okay, uh, on the PC side, um, you know, my first computer at this time was a um, Radio Shack Tandy uh, 1000 HX computer, which is a basically a, 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 a 286 um, a 8 megahertz computer. Okay, so very very slow. We're talking basically. Uh, uh, you know, now a lot of people are asking, well, you know, you know, can we step back and um, and sort of uh, you know revise, you know, what uh, all these uh, c computer types are? Well, if you can kind of remember back in this time, uh, you know, it said uh, you know the the, the Pentium uh, uh, 802, uh, 286 type of uh, systems are basically you know uh, you know your first 16-bit bus type of uh, processors, and sure, a uh, uh, you know 16 megahertz was relatively slow, okay. Because um, um, you know, you think of it like you know, you know, today's computers, they're in the thousands of megahertz. Okay, um, sure. At this time, 386s, which is the next uh, revision up. Okay, which has the you know the first 32-bit bus. Um, 
you know, they were coming out, okay, they were around 20 megahertz, but again, the processor itself probably cost you pretty close to just a thousand dollars just for the processor itself. So, you know, we're talking very pricey systems at this time that really did not much of anything. Um, okay, just uh, as a sort of a, 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 you know, a, a comparison, if you will, um, you're talking about the speed of the computer, where, you know, this stupid, uh, you know, sandy computer, you know, was great back then, but now, you know, you know, we're talking like, you know, it was operating at, at 8 megahertz, okay? Uh, not a lot of computers nowadays, quad core, could easily give you at least 8,000 cycles uh, going right now, okay? So, something that would, you know, you'd use your Excel spreadsheet, you change a number, takes a, like a second to, to propagate the changes and uh, update the spreadsheet. Well, that same change on that same spreadsheet on that uh, Tandy 1000HX could easily take you over 17 minutes to refresh that one little change and repropagate that change across that cell spell sheet. So we're talking very slow, all right? Okay. The other major th th difference is, is that the amount of storage on these computers was very, very small. On this, you know, Tandy HX computer that I had, it only ran on basically a five and a quarter inch floppy and a three and a half inch floppy. That was all I had, okay? So we're talking, you know, 720 kilobytes. Um, you know, the floppy disk get was 1.44 megabytes. Now, to give you an idea, you know, you know, we're talking nowadays of going out to the store and buying terabyte computers, okay? So they hold, you know, literally thousands to ten thousands of pictures, okay? But could you imagine this HX computer, the largest hard drive that was out there, still cost about a thousand dollars, was 40 megabytes. That's it. So, you know, I can take my iPhone 6 here, go one, two, three, four, take four selfies, one, two, three, four, take some selfies on my food, one, two, three, four, oh, that's it. My hard drive's full. That's right. 16 pictures. That's all you could take, and that hard drive would be full. Now, I know a lot of people, you probably know, do that on their phone already, but then take pictures of their food and themselves and they run out of uh, memory. That's a different story, but in this sort of application, yes, 16 pictures and you're, that hard drive is full. So you, you can get it. There's no way you can do um, you know, uh, these uh, AMVs or graphical editing like you, do on these, on, uh, like you do nowadays with these type of computers that we had. They just couldn't store the space. They, you know, the, the processors were so slow, they couldn't handle musical data or picture data, or even for this case, you know, no matter, you know, video data um, uh, through them because it's just, they just weren't fast enough. So, how did we do it and how you know, could we uh, get this technology that allows us to do it back then? Well, a lot of the, the ideas was on these peripherals, these things that you added onto them because the computers were themselves not fast enough to do what you needed it to do all alone. So what they did is they add different peripherals, different boxes, if you will, different um, interface cards, if you will, uh, that will actually do the different things that you need to do, okay? In our time, th th there are two main things that we needed uh, to, 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 to uh, get in order to do subtitling. Uh, one was called a Genlock device, okay? Now, I had one, uh, or short for you know, TBC for short, um, uh, there's, a, there's another type of box that we needed, which, is the, which stands for a time-based corrector, which basically helps you uh, st uh, stabilize the picture uh, once you've got, uh, mixed the computer data with the video pic uh, uh, data. But the Genlock, again, uh, if you've ever watched your news, this is the, th the device which allows um, uh, the weathercaster to stand in front of a blank, say, blue screen or a green screen, and then they can use the computer to uh, draw a picture of the uh, map behind the, the weather person while the person stands in front of the weather picture. Now what we can use the, that for subtitling is basically the same idea. Um, we would put computer text on, these, on this computer screen and then the, wherever uh, the screen is green, um, that's where the actual moving video would go, okay? But to say again, the computer wasn't fast enough to do this by itself, so they had a separate box, a gen locking box to do this. Now, we initially did buy one of these gen locking boxes for the Amiga 1000 computer uh, uh, back in the day. 
But again, uh, you know, we had a lot of issues with trying to get software to work, and uh, you know, a lot of things like crashing, timing issues, and all that other stuff. Uh, again, you know, a lot of the, 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 I'll get into uh, issues that we had in another, in, in, you know, in a further episode. But I'm just going to just touch on on this device that we got. Uh, called a gen locking box. Later on, we ended up getting the uh, True Vista one from for a Macintosh. Again, because of the software that um, was developed um, by uh, one of the members of the uh, Cartoon Fantasy Organization, uh, CFO. Uh, I managed to use uh, some contacts there, and uh, someone had managed to uh, uh, create some software for that. Again, I'll get that into a, a further episode. I uh, won't touch on it too much on this one. Um, again, you want to subscribe and we'll get more details about actual subtitling and that kind of you know technical, more technical subtitling stuff, uh, more technical than what we're doing now, um, in a future episode. So hit subscribe for that. So uh, that was the first box that we needed. It's what's something called a gen locking box. The other one was called a TBC. We got a, that one a little bit later um, after the Amiga, uh, uh, you know, first Amiga trial days. Um, we uh, got this uh, uh, time-based correcting the, the device uh, for the Mac as well. Um, and that again, that helped stabilize the picture, stop that, uh, you know, the, the, the little jittering that it has, improves tracking, so when you uh, make a recording on VHS, uh, the, you know, the copy looks a lot sharper. Uh, again, this is uh, another one of those type of ideas where, again, the computer by itself wasn't fast enough nor strong enough to do this, so we actually had to get a separate box to do the processing, and that was how a lot of things worked. It basically, it, it took um, a video input or something, it did its kind of processing to it, whether gen locking or time-based correcting it, and then basically then fed the output back out again, so that another box could be then handed this video picture to then reprocess it again, re-edit it, and that kind of stuff, and then put the video output again back out, and then that video output could then be put into another processor, maybe uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, a power uh, razor, you know, you, you could. Uh, maybe uh, adjust the, uh, the, the the levels of the of the, of the contrast or the brightness, and then maybe even further on that would uh, you know, send it to a color correction unit, and maybe then afterwards then send it to a VCR to actually do the recording. So as you see, lots of different boxes and peripherals that kept you know tagging in and out the signal before we actually get to the recorded product. Okay, so you know that gives you an idea of some of the, uh, the you know, these, the, the tech devices that we actually had to get into in order to make our subtitling work, okay? Um, again, and the software, okay? This is, this is probably the last part of tech that I need to really cover. Um, it was very difficult to write anything that was very, you know, lengthy, because again, we're still talking on the on the PC side. We're still you know we're start, still talking uh, MS DOS 3.1. Okay, so we're not we don't, we still don't have a Windows graphical interface yet because Windows 3.1 hasn't even come out at this particular time, and they were just only just starting to come out with that because you know uh, again my you know Tandy HX basically booted up and ran entirely off of the floppy diskette, the 1.44. Uh, a megabyte floppy diskette, and, and everything ran exclusively off of those disks. There was no hard drive in that particular computer. Okay, um, because of this, this uh, you know daisy chaining and processing uh, due, due to the fact that you know we don't have the, the computer being able to store any part of the video data or uh, 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 or textual data at all. Everything had to be done on the fly. So basically, as soon as the video signal comes in, the computer does its uh, little bit, or the, 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 this peripheral box, the TVC or the Genlock would do its little thing that it does, and then immediately refeed that signal right back out again. So it's a uh, kind of a one in and then one out type of thing. Okay, a very, very quick. There's no storage whatsoever. So therefore, something like a, 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 you know, like a, a non-linear editing was not possible. So you know all the things that you you would uh, normally do inside a um, uh, you know post editing software, even like something like iMovie or something, was not possible. You couldn't fix a mistake that happened several minutes ago, or you know you decide you, you're going to change your mind on how you want that screen transition to happen. You can't go back and change it. If you would, if you do, then you have, you'll have to basically. Rewind all the tapes, rewind all the, the, the source media, and start all over again. Okay, uh, 
So again, what I mentioned in, a, in an earlier episode, um, you know, these computers weren't very powerful, so we couldn't do graphical, you know, for example, karaoke lyrics, and we couldn't do, um, you know, throw up a picture or a JPEG of uh, an image onto the screen because, again, these computers weren't fast enough to, to, to really, uh, you know, bring up that kind of graphical interface. Uh, not to include that there wasn't any place on the hard drive or on these floppy disks to, to store all this stuff. Okay, it basically had to be you, you know, had just moments to get the image or the the words onto the screen. You know, let the Genlock do its job uh, and interface the video, and then basically record that uh, in live time on the fly as you do it. Again, if you made a mistake, you gotta gotta kind of live with that mistake, or you're gonna have to hit rewind, to hit stop and then rewind everything back to the beginning again and redo it all over again. And so that was, uh, uh, no, that was a really tough transition at the very beginning. And, and yeah, sure, I'll admit, uh, some of the first early subtitles that, that we did probably suffered a little bit because of that, because uh, you know, we were unable to get any level of accuracy and, and, and uh, basically uh, you know, overcome some of the techno technological challenges that these computers um, and the lack of the ability of, the, of some of the software that was available for these things. Again, I'll get that into a, a, into a separate episode because that's, you know, uh, technological uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, software issues and, uh, and even hardware issues, uh, you know, are a little bit more than I, that I can cover on in this particular episode. Um, but I just want to give you a quick little overview, um, uh, you know, what kind of problems that we, we, you would encounter uh, back in the 1985 uh, era. Um, and uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, what we had to start with, and this is what we had to begin with. So again, you know, uh, lots of, shall we say, uh, you know, uh, learning curves that we had to, to, to approach. And you know, sure, uh, you know, some of the results, uh, you know, will change. And again, uh, you know, the ideology of what the Arctic animation was doing was uh, really based off of, uh, you know, trying to get the 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 product out as quickly as we could. Because again, uh, in retrospect, uh, you know, a lot of us now, um, you know, would probably look back and say, "Well, those fan sub tapes that you would have now, uh, well, you wouldn't probably have them now." And so it's probably a good thing that you did. We didn't spend all that time making them so perfectly, you know, shall we say, timed and you know, trying to fight all the technological issues and trying to spend all that money trying to get around all those things when. Really, uh, what was really needed is is more output and more variety and more shows that you could actually watch. Because again, uh, getting that all out there was probably uh, a, a better, more beneficial thing for the anime industry than it was to have you know more perfect and more commercial uh, like uh, fan subs. Because a lot of those things now that we've done have now been commercially released. And of course, you know, if you look at it now, very few of you guys out there will have, um, you know, vintage copies of fan subs anymore because uh, all these other companies have already released DVDs of and Blu-rays of the exact same animes in literally perfect quality. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, the fan subs that we had to work with um, now are probably sitting in a landfill uh, being magnetically decomposed as we speak. So, if you have any further questions, you want to leave some comments or uh, you want to you know, shoot me an email, absolutely. Right below me here is the, our contact information. You can just send an email, and give me some suggestions, uh, comments, maybe some clarification. Maybe you got an idea for another episode. Uh, by all means, I'd love to hear from you. Okay, and the second way that you can participate uh, with this uh, video cast is I'm wearing a ball cap for the uh, Vintage Montreal Expos. And uh, you can send your uh, ball cap of your favorite team or all night and uh, I will wear it here as well and uh, give you a shout out for a, for a player. And so my player that I'm giving a shout out to today is, uh, is the pitcher, uh, Steve Rogers for the uh, Ventral Expo. Very ace um, uh, pitcher for that. So, and since we're all talking about aces, I'm gonna give you a different type of ace, okay? Since we're talking about classic animes and that stuff, how about a shooting ace? I wanted to go for Area 88. It was one of the very first, uh, air, uh, you know, air combat type of uh, uh, animes that there are, um, you know. And it was kind of a different thing, you know, you know the, the French mercenaries and the, you know, the missions uh, 
uh, that, but it was definitely it really excited me because I said I was I was really into uh, you know airplanes and uh, you know and even when the things like Robotech came out and how um, you know how the you know how the Veritex and the Valkyries uh, you know transformed and that stuff really really was interesting. So again, if you're looking for uh, yeah, air combat type of thing and uh, aces as it were, yes, okay, Steve Rogers, I recommend Area 88, uh, 3 OV A set. All right. So until next time. I will see you again.